What's good everybody, this is Robo from Bark back with another video, and today I'm bringing you my first version of my 2024 NBA Draft Big Board. I'm planning on making a few Big Board update videos in the future, one around playoff time, and then another after the entrance are set in stone, and then another one a few weeks before the draft, of course. I'll also be making mock draft videos throughout the process, so stay tuned for those. That's all I've got to say for now, so let's go ahead and get started with the Big Board, starting with some honorable mentions. Here are my top freshman honorable mentions right now. So guys that aren't in my top 60, but have good enough NBA potential for some recognition, some of these freshmen, such as Elliot Cadeau and Brandon Garrison, I would absolutely see getting drafted if they were to declare. However, as it stands right now, I'd be pretty surprised if that were their decision, as they all could really benefit from returning to school next year. And now here's a list of all the draftable mid-major prospects outside of my top 60 that I think deserve some shine and draft consideration. I do think a number of these guys can climb up the boards if they opt to enter the draft, but a lot of them will also be candidates to transfer up to the high major level to showcase their NBA talent in front of better competition. And if not, they should be able to continue a level of play high enough to be draftable regardless. Lastly, before we get into the top 60, here are my honorable mentions. There isn't a big tier gap between a lot of these guys, and I didn't really care too much about putting them in an exact numbered order other than the guys closer to the top. I think a lot of these guys are draftable. This is fairly deep class in terms of NBA talent, in my opinion, but just pretty weak towards the top in terms of impact potential and star power compared to other years. It's definitely a weaker class overall, but as I said, I think there's plenty of draftable talent. Starting with Old Rich Chomche, he's a projected first rounder by some, but from what I've seen, he's considering the college or development route pretty hard, so I have him here for now. Some of my favorites in this list are Princeton guard Xavier Lee, who I've been debating putting inside the top 60 recently. I also love freshman JT Toppin out of New Mexico, Harvard freshman Malik Mack, and a few other big-time sleepers in St. Thomas from Northern Colorado, William Kyle III out of South Dakota State, and Belmont forward Malik Dia. Starting off the big board are the guys I see as top 60 prospects. I'm a big fan of several of these guys, including Jalen Tyson out of Cal and Dylan Jones from Weber State, two guys I think have serious first-round potential. I also love Judah Mintz game. He's having an incredible year right now. Another guy I like a lot is Miami's Kaishan George who continues to rise up boards and may end up a first rounder on mine eventually. My personal favorite underrated guard though is Donovan Dent. The growth he's made in the span of one year is tremendous and I think he absolutely has what it takes to compete for minutes in the NBA level. With Bronny James he was a lot higher on my board before the heart issue and I do believe in him as a prospect but I need to see consistent aggressiveness to really consider him a first rounder right now. Before we get into the first round I want to mention I left Terrence Shannon Jr. off the list because of the legal stuff. He's back playing, but I haven't seen much of how the NBA feels about his situation. But as a player, Shannon is very deserving of a late first round pick to me, maybe even a top 20 pick. At 30 on my big board, I've got Purdue big man Zach Eady. Eady is an absolute giant of a big man built mainly for the college game, but he's developed enough mobility and instincts to fit in the NBA game as well. Often compared to a big man like Ivica Zubac, Eady stands out with his 7'4 frame. But with that, he also has a great feel for the game and incredible touch in the paint. And during last year's draft process, he showcased his ability to knock down threes, although that still is not a part of his game at Purdue. He's as dominant as it gets at the college level down low, and if he keeps expanding his game, whoever takes him in the first round will be extremely happy with their investment. Look at this, Ali. Oh, it's Edie! Edie at three! Next is Izan Almansa from the G League Ignite. Originally from Spain, Almansa also played at Overtime Elite last year and really put himself on the map for Team Spain. Izan's an efficient paint scorer and dominant offensive rebounding big man. He's also a fairly versatile finisher on the rim and a solid pick and roll big who looks to impact winning in a decent way. Low turnovers, solid defense and IQ, and a fantastic touch in the paint on floaters and layups is his game. Inside it goes to Almansa Johnson. His teardrop miss. A big time riser is up next with Dayton big man Duran Holmes II. Duran's a big time athlete big man who plays mainly in the middle of the floor. He plays with power and strength as a role man and has shown some perimeter ability. He's a solid paint defender as well with blocking and affecting shots at the rim and is having a huge season at Dayton as a potential player of the year candidate. Big step. Number 27 is the NBL's Bobby Clintman. Originally from Sweden, Clintman also attended Wake Forest last season and is a really polarizing prospect who has been all over boards for years now. He's still raw overall, but he's a lengthy forward with solid slashing ability for skinnier size. And he has a solid feel for his jumper, which is pretty fluid, but needs consistency to become more reliable. Clintman. 
26 is somewhat of a high spot for Kentucky freshman DJ Wagner as his level of play has forced his stock down quite a bit, but I'm still a believer in his first round potential. He's a super crafty ball handler and natural scorer at all three levels. He has good length for his position with a 6 foot 10 wingspan and can really fit at either guard spot. At Kentucky this season, he's had his ups and downs, but he started to find his groove before an injury, which is why I'm still pretty high on him. I think he's shown the growth off ball to be considered more than a ball dominant guard at this point. We'll have to see how he continues to play throughout the remainder of the season when he's back from injury. And the shot clock. Wagner, right around Van Wagner, that's underneath him for his jump shot. Wagner did on that. Up next is Marquette big man Oso Igadaro. Oso has an incredible feel for the game as a passer, screener, and roll man. He knows how to switch on defense and plays winning basketball at all times. This year he's had great efficiency inside but is not a threat from outside at all. He has some Sabonis qualities to his game. I'd say more of a Trace Jackson Davis comp is better but a bit taller and stronger defensively. But definitely in that range of a player. Gold again, same spot. Beat Kansas. Stolen in the open floor, Igadaro. Tolik up top for Iguodaro. Iguodaro. Hey, you're going to get a look. Look at this two-man play. Jared McCain comes in at 24 for me. What McCain brings to the table is a winning player who brings high-level shooting to the floor, but can also put the ball on the floor to attack a closeout when he needs to. He's not a consistent lead ball handler, but can run an offense at times. He's also a solid passer and defender, but the shooting ability right now leads him to a high-impact two in the NBA until he grows into more of a one. Gerard one for five. Will it come down to that? Here's McCain. Just and Duke in transition, and McCain launches. Picked up by McCain. He'll fire. He hit the deck. We're running the other way with McCain behind the back. Creighton guard Trey Alexander is one of my favorite gems from this class. Not many have him this high, and some have him really deep in the second round, but I really like his game. He's struggling from three this season, which is why some are so down on him, but he's always been a solid shooter from range and has been great in the mid-range and attacking the basket this year while hitting big-time shots from deep when it matters. He should be a combo guard at the next level as he can play on and off the ball, and some defensive flashes allow him to stay on the floor even when the shots aren't falling for Creighton this season. Your Fred Hoiberg's club. Alexander gets a look, and he hit it! One minute to go in the half, five on the shot clock. Alexander. Coming in at number 22 is Indiana center Kalel Ware. Ware is a former top prospect who didn't perform at Oregon but found a home at Indiana, showcasing his athleticism and length as an elite shot blocker and dunker with good footwork in the paint on both ends of the floor. He has enough skill to play on the perimeter and can knock down jumpers. The biggest question is about his motor as he seems to take possessions and even nights off, but his potential is pretty high and the right fit could help unlock it. Indiana's made the most of him. Carrington, a good job. He's known for his defense. Shut down. Gets rid of it to Galloway. Now with Ware on the other end. Up next is a huge draft riser and Australian wing Johnny Furphy. Furphy chose to attend Kansas this season, and after a low minute stretch early on, he's blossomed into a great prospect for this year's draft. He's an elite shooter with great size on the floor, can both spot up and pull up off the dribble, and thrives in relocation settings. And he's a solid defender in terms of IQ, but can obviously grow in that area, as well as ball handling when he's on the ball. I do think it's a solid bet that Furphy could project to be a solid spot up wing in the NBA, though. Providence guard Devin Carter is one of the best defenders in the country. He's incredibly active with a freak level motor, an absurd amount of confidence on both ends of the floor. He's very athletic at the guard spot with a ton of range in the jump shot, and he can score at every level. Shot selection, age, and potential are the only reasons he isn't seen as a lottery level player, but he's taken a huge leap in his game this season, especially after Bryce Hopkins lost his season to a knee injury. Hoist a deep three. Oh, and Carter with a steal. The exclamation point. Up next is Virginia forward Ryan Dunn. Dunn is a great athlete who thrives on the defensive side of the ball. He's arguably the best overall defender in the draft as he has incredible ability to shut down possessions with affecting jumpers and swatting shots at the rim. He lives in the passing lanes and dominates games defensively. He does have an ability to shoot the ball, but not consistently and at a high clip, but definitely needs to grow as an offensive player or his role will be limited to a defensive ace in the league.
Number 18 is another one of my favorites. Originally playing at OTE last season, 6'11 for Tyler Smith. I thought I was a bit premature mocking him as a first rounder in my way too early mock last year, but he's now seen as a definite first round pick with some lottery buzz as well. In terms of his game, he's a strong body lefty with a great jumper, solid athleticism, and can put the ball on the floor on a closeout. Defensively, he blocks shots well, but isn't a true anchor or rim defending five at the next level, so he fits best as a stretch four in the NBA. Smith sets the screen. He's gonna launch from deep. Is this short in the last game? Yeah, he's a wa he is. He's a walking triple double. Wow. UConn big man Donovan Klingon is next at 17. An injury stalled his season for a bit, but he's picked right back up where he left off. At seven foot two, Klingon's a huge big man who brings a ton of defensive potential as an anchor five with strong rim protection and quick feet. Offensively, he isn't an outside threat at all, but he knocked on a three earlier this season, potentially showing that it could come at some point. But he mainly sticks to being a great role man and post finisher, using his size and skill around the rim, as well as playmaking out of the post. Kansas wing Kevin McCullough is an all-around prospect with a lot of versatility. He brings excellent defensive IQ and instincts, plays hard on both ends, and has blossomed into a number one type of scoring option at Kansas while being a very solid passer on the wing. The jump shot's still coming along, but he's found a lot of success this season with it and can score in many other ways with a strong athletic frame and solid game in transition and inside the arc, which makes him a potential lottery pick in my opinion. T. John Salon is a high potential French born wing with great athleticism and broad shoulders with the potential to grow into a much stronger attacker. He's already a straight line driver to the rim using his speed and quick first step. And on the defensive end, he uses that to his advantage being an active defender at all times. He's still pretty raw with a lot of untapped potential and wrote a huge hot streak to really rise up a lot of boards and even inside the ESPN's current top 10. I don't mind that at all. I would just like to see a bit more production before putting him inside that tier for sure. But with his size and shooting ability, I think he's a decent bet to become a solid 3 and D player at the NBA level with potential to grow into much more. Big man Eves Misi comes in at number 14 out of Baylor. Misi is an absolute beast in the paint, pretty similar to a Jared Allen, Jalen Duran type of young big man in the NBA. Misi draws a lot of Clint Capella comps, and for good reason, he's been such a reliable screener and role man for Baylor. He works harder than anyone else on the floor and has incredible athleticism and strength, and could develop into a legitimate defensive anchor at the 5 in the NBA. The lack of a jump shot is what caused him to not be considered a top 10 prospect by most, but with how dominant he can be on the defensive end, just like some other recent big body centers, I think he's more than worthy of a lottery consideration. Dalton Connect is arguably the biggest riser of the season going from Northern Colorado to a National Player of the Year candidate at Tennessee and I've got him here at number 13. Connect brings an elite three-point shooting to the floor as well as NBA level athleticism and enough on-ball ability to operate in a pick and roll as a handler and a scorer. He can finish at the rim as well as pull up from any spot in the half court and should be able to positively impact an offense right away in the league. At number 12 is Kyle Filipowski. Flip is another polarizing prospect, somewhat all over boards. He's a near 7 foot stretch big who has a really strong floor mobility for his size as well as being an above average ball handling big with a solid jump shot extending out to 3 point range. He's shown more playmaking ability this season and has been much improved on the defensive end which was easily his biggest question mark when he considered entering last year's draft. He seems more capable of defending the rim and staying in front of bigs than he was a year ago. Their practices this year. There you go. But also four first half assists. Filipowski a soft fall away. Conversation to what people used to call me that all the time. <laughs> Isaiah Collier is a former number one player in the class of 2023 and was originally slated to be a top three pick in this draft before some poor efficiency play and an injury that sidelined him for several weeks. But I think what gets lost in the process is how often freshman guards go through this transition period to the college game. Much slower and more defensive focus, and a guy like Collier has shown he can be an incredible creator in isolation in the pick and roll. He's got a nasty first step to help him get downhill often, and he draws fouls at a ridiculous rate. He's also a very skilled passer at the point as well. I think Collier should still be considered a potential top 10 pick in this draft.
At number 10, I've got Stefan Castle, who struggled quite a bit, especially with the jumper early on in his college career. But as of late, he's found new confidence in his jumper and now looks like a serious big league guard talent who can make plays downhill as both a scorer and a playmaker and has to be guarded on the perimeter as he's shown that capability from deep now. He's got the size, tools, and athleticism to be a strong defensive guard as well. And because of his on-ball ability, he should fit the mold of a true point guard at the next level with similar qualities to a guy like Anthony Black. Castle, four on the clock. Number 9 is Reed Shepard, who is one of my favorite guards in the entire class and a huge early season riser thanks to his activity on the defensive end as well as his elite efficiency as a shooter, putting up some of the highest efficiency numbers a college freshman has ever seen so far. He's got great court vision as a lead ball handler and has a high motor with incredible anticipation and instincts on the floor. The only limitations that come with Reed are his size and athleticism. He is a capable athlete, but doesn't have the elite quickness to get downhill with consistency yet. But we've seen guards like him work out in the past as they can get creative at finding ways to score outside of the jumper. Next in the 8th spot, I have Jacoby Walter. Walter exploded onto the scene after he proved himself early on in the season as one of the best guards in the freshman class, scoring at an elite level for a great Baylor team. Although he can be streaky at times, Jacoby's an elite shooter with some real playmaking flashes. He fits better as a scoring guard than a lead guard, but the ball handling is there if the creation keeps growing. But right now, he's a real shot creator for himself and enough of a competitor on defense to be able to compete at the NBA level right away with a very high ceiling as a gifted natural scorer. Walter. Modest Buzels comes in at number 7 on my board. He's a wing forward hybrid prospect who brings great size for his on-ball skill level. He's a gifted off-ball shooter, which will probably be his role early on in the league. But as the on-ball creation continues to grow, he can develop into the type of player Franz Wagner is becoming in the NBA. Another good comp for Buzelis would be Tony Kukic. With his size and scoring ability, he can bring a lot of what he had to the NBA. I think Buzelis has a fairly high floor because of his size and shooting ability, and the potential he could bring with a growing on-ball game could make him a home run draft pick in the top 10 of this draft. Rob Dillingham is easily my favorite guard to watch in this draft, as for many people who have seen him play this season. He's absolutely lit it up this season and has been the best freshman in the country. He's not often asked to run the offense, but when he has the ball, Rob is a super shifty ball handler who can pull up from absolutely anywhere on the path court at any time. He plays at a high pace, but is extremely quick as a ball handler and can go coast to coast in a blur. He's a lot similar to a Emmanuel Quickly or Tyrese Maxey type of player in the offensive end. There are some size questions, but they shouldn't matter much with his craftiness. And defensively, he's no ace, but if he puts on some size and learns a bit more on that side of the ball, it could become less of a question. Cody Williams, my top college prospect in the country right now, sitting here at number 5. He's got great tools and size on the wing and finishes at the rim very well and can get there often as a ball handler. He's got a strong handle for his position and is a solid connective passer with solid feel for the game. Pretty similar to his brother Jalen Williams. Another big quality of Cody is he draws fouls pretty well, which is a huge part of today's game. In the half court, he could improve as both a creator and a shooter. A strong jump shot could make him an elite scoring option, but regardless on the other end, he could guard the two through the four and be a capable enough offensive talent to play big minutes in the NBA. His best player comp to me would be Jeremy Grant before the jumper became more reliable, but he can get there in a similar way. And that's a long three for Cody Williams. But here's the problem. They weren't late in the shot clock. Cody Williams just must at number 4, I have Nikola Topic as my top guard in this draft class, as many others agree right now. He has some athleticism questions, but he's a typical European guard with great size for a point guard, and he's an excellent pick-and-roll ball handler and initiator. He can push the ball downhill with ease and get to the rim where he's pretty crafty as a finisher. He's a very capable defender as well. The big question is going to be how successful a shooter he is. As early on, that could be a problem, but he's got decent form and a lot to suggest growth in that area. But the percentages just haven't been there as well as the consistency. However, his ability to pour in points and dominate games offensively without a great jumper are the big reason why he's going to be a top pick in this year's draft.
Ron Holland is my number three prospect in the class as of today. Poor efficiency and turnovers have caused him to fall to the mid lottery in a lot of places, but not for me. Going into the Ignite, we knew he was a pretty raw prospect, and the scoring burst on top of his defense makes a potential star forward to me. He's got a nasty first step and a lot of versatility on both ends, which is exactly what NBA teams are looking for in their wings. And his length can help him dominate as both an on-ball defender and off-ball pest. He's still developing as a shot creator and facilitator, and he's added some weight to his frame. But he's dominated the G League level so far, averaging over 20 points a game at just 18 years old. Getting by with his athleticism and natural scoring ability, and the shooting growth he's made thus far tell me he can become a pretty reliable shooter down the line a few years from now. Zachary Rizache is another great French prospect who really proved himself thus far as one of the best prospects in this class, and even a potential option with a number one pick. He's an elite shooter, especially off the catch, and with his size, he has some high defensive upside. I'm not sure he'll ever be an outstanding playmaker, but he's shown some flashes and has enough ability to be a connective wing. The Michael Porter Jr. comparisons aren't too far off. With Rizache, you're getting a big shoot first wing who can bring it on both ends of the floor when needed and create some plays for his team on a nightly basis. Alexandre Sarr is my number one prospect in this 2024 draft class right now for a multitude of reasons. If anyone from this class is going to turn into a star player, he would be my best bet. He's an incredibly agile big man who looks to be an elite rim protector with enough mobility to guard the perimeter at a high level. The assist numbers don't show it, but he's been a reliable passer and has a great feel for scoring the basketball even from deep. He's a pretty similar player to a Jaron Jackson Jr., but honestly, he's a lot more like Jonathan Isaac with a more reliable offensive game. Just an elite defensive prospect with a lot of mobility and a jumper that has a lot of potential. That's it for my first big board of the 2024 NBA Draft Class. A lot's going to change from now until draft day, so as I said, I'll be making a lot of update videos in the future, probably around March Madness and another around the draft entry deadline, and then of course a bit before the draft, so stay tuned for all of those as well as the future mock drafts. But other than that, thanks for watching. Feel free to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.